welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a brand new author to the DMT Forest of Fear channel and from the wonderful mind of David Morning Wee. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled The Mountain. Let's get straight into that. The alarm clock woke Wade up with a start. He had been deep within his own dreamland, and so the noise had brought him up a bit jarringly. However, a smile quickly appeared on his face, replacing the look of shock and annoyance. Today he started the Hawthorne job, and it would be at least seven times more lucrative than any other past job. The widower John Hawthorne had hastily moved from a remote location deep within the Appalachian Mountains into a new location about as far into the Olympic Mountains of Washington State as one could possibly go. It was rumoured that he just couldn't stand living in his isolated mansion without his wife any longer. And so he found similar forests about as far away as he could possibly move to build or buy a new place. This idea had brought him to Washington State and the used mini mansion he'd bought on top of a mountain and weathered roof in bad need of repair had brought him to Wade. And more specifically, Wade's weatherproofing and roofs. A business Wade had been running with great success for almost 12 years now. Locals knew you could hire a larger company for quicker work, but a Wade, you have a better quality work at a slightly more reasonable price. And this fact had made his small cell phone company quite popular with the locals. For living in Washington with its notorious weather, he wanted the best possible quality of roof available. Wade had prepared everything the prior night, from setting out his tools to be easily loaded into the four-wheel drive work van, to presenting his coffee maker to where one simple push of a button would take care of the whole process. This made his morning routine go by much faster, getting him on the road almost 45 minutes ahead of schedule. Wade always despised being in a rush, especially for more important matters like today. He kept going over the checklist in his mind to ensure he didn't leave anything behind. Even though he had driven so far, he really could have turned around, even if he wanted to. This job was a bit different than the others, due to the extremely remote location of the mansion in the Olympic Forest. And yes, mansion was most definitely the right word for the marvel of constructive ingenuity. Now, it was seven stories high on top of a mountain that he had never visited, and was unnamed, so geography couldn't even be located on any form of GPS. In other words, there was no proof that a mountain actually existed. But Wade had seen firsthand how rich people created their own laws and reality, and so it didn't immediately alarm him. The location dwarfed all other mountain peaks surrounding the area, and so to say he would be working high up, home as one hell of an understatement. Its architecture it was unorthodox as well. Most mansions were wide and extra long to give the owner an open and large area, simulating their own little private world. But this creation traded all of its width for height, perhaps to try and achieve the best possible view. This fact also made this job far more his most dangerous, and required Wade to purchase extra safety equipment, from a new body harness in case he would need to hang at odd angles, or God forbid, fall off. He also bought a couple of special long hatchet-like tools that he could stab into the roof if he was starting to slide off. Similar to ice picks that mountain climbers use for relatively the same reason. Even though his titanium hammer had an extended claw on it that made it similar to a pick-like tool, he was forced to put it to the test on a particularly high roofing job he did a couple of years ago. He was walking down an unshingled part of the roof where he slipped on some loose nails that someone had spilt out of their tool belt. While falling down, he first attempted sinking his claw hammer into the wood with only half luck, going in less than an inch before his body weight and momentum ripped it back out 
continuing his unwilling descent. And only with God's grace, he often states, and every ounce of adrenaline and upper body strength was he able to sink in the extended claw, thus stopping his fatalistic demise of human versus gravity with his feet just 11 inches from the roof's edge. After seeing how high up this roof was, he decided to buy the ice picks and put together some custom leather sheaths to holster them so that he would be able to pull them out quickly and safely if the need arose. He had also bought a cordless nail gun, which wasn't quite as powerful as the corded ones, especially the larger older model he called Biggin, for its extreme power and the fact he could fire off the large three and a half inch heavy duty framing nails. And although the old model safeguard the piece of steel that prevents the nails from firing off until pressed firmly down against the wood. I had broken off. He was able to successfully spot weld it back on in working order, deeming it fit for one last job before being replaced. He also thought it wise to bring his 12 gauge shotgun, and with double or buckshot and grizzly slugs, which looked similar to a shotgun shell with a hollowed out mini rocket inside. Real powerful stuff. The Olympic Forest are home to many large predators and he was going to be as far out in the wilderness of Washington as you could get, and on top of the mountain, and so it was not at all far-fetched to assume that he could run into trouble. After almost an hour of driving through highways that transitioned into smaller local backroads, and now gravel, he was about to reach the base of the mountain. In another six minutes he had arrived, pausing at the entrance, it was gated. He exited his vehicle and punched in the 0333 in the digital panel, which beeped three times before opening to him almost soundlessly. He put his van into four-wheel drive, took a sip of coffee, and began his long ascension up the mountain. Now Wade knew from coming up to price the job almost three weeks prior that a trip up the mountain would take the better part of an hour, and so he put on a playlist of downloaded music to help him ease the trip. He would usually just rely on Spotify or Pandora to take care of his musical needs, but already knew that such things were useless out here, where data is mostly pointless and Wi-Fi practically non-existent. In preparation for this, he had downloaded hundreds of songs and podcasts to accompany him on the job, and Lonely Mountain. He let himself zone out on his trip upwards, barely even noticing anything around him, as he enjoyed some of his favourite music over the past 30 years. Wade was 47 years old, and so he had quite a wide variety of music that he had enjoyed over his lifetime. And with his mind half wandering through random thoughts and half in whatever music was currently playing, Wade almost missed the pair of large antlers up on the hill by his right, above the gravel road. He only caught the tip of them before the shrubbery they navigated through had given them cover. He pressed on his brakes, bringing a vehicle to a slow stop, as not to skid on the gravel, and optimistically waited for the antlers to reach the end of the thicket, hoping to catch a glance at the creature. After almost a minute of waiting, he thought that it must have fled in the other direction, and went to put his vehicle back into fallow from park, when his patience was suddenly rewarded. A massive buck had now slowly exited the thick bushes and displayed itself proudly upon the hilltop for Wade to marvel at. It was above and beyond any buck Wade had ever seen. Not one record-breaking photo had he seen online or on television came even remotely close. This deer was bigger than any moose he'd seen, which was impossible, thought Wade in near shock. He hastily grabbed his phone to catch the beast on video, However, by the time he fumbled his way into his pants pocket to grab his phone, he was so excited that he didn't execute a good grip with his left hand and dropped it on the floorboard before he had it halfway to the open passenger side window for a picture. Shit, he muttered under his breath before frantically reaching for the phone. Now he reached down so quick though, his seatbelt snagged him halfway with his safety feature, slightly knocking the wind out of him. Of course, by the time he had overcome the gauntlet of mundane obstacles in his way, the ancient buck was gone, existing only in his memory now. Sighing and letting out a few choice words, 
He shifted back to Forlow and continued his ascent. People just don't see things like that out their window every day, you know, thought Wade as he sifted through his current playlist of music, before deciding just to go with a random audio book to try and focus on something else. As he arrived at the second gate at the top of the mountain preceding the estate itself, he once again exited his vehicle to punch in a digital code for entry, the only difference being that he typed 0999 this time. And after only a few dozen feet past the gate, Wade saw a man standing directly in front of the mansion's entrance, and with his hands clasped behind his back in a patient yet serious manner. And the man was old, but in most excellent shape. I'm not saying he was in shape for his age, which was about 70 from his appearance. No, he was in shape for anyone's age. Now, he was about 6 foot 2 and about 185 pounds, and with a short, military-style flat-top haircut that held three long lines on the right side of his haircut's fade, just above and behind the ear, and spanned about six inches, stopping just before it reached the very back of his head. And as he approached closer to the gentleman, pulling in sideways to the driver's side door would face the man, he noticed in slight awe that the lines on his head were in fat scars. And this would be Wade's first time actually meeting Mr. Hawthorne in person, having only communicated through phone or email before now. Even when Wade had priced the job, there wasn't a soul up here. Exhaling deeply, he put his most professional and courteous face on, and he opened his door, smiling. And Mr. Hawthorne, with his hands still behind his back, wore a slight smile, almost a smirk which accompanied by the fact that he looked like his muscles were carved out of stone, gave way the impression of a great leader, like someone made a perfect statue of an elder protagonist hero. Wade also felt a certain energy or aura as he approached a man, like he had seen and done things Wade couldn't even imagine, and such things as roof repair were simply trivial to him. Uh, good morning, sir. Wade cheerfully exclaimed to him, outstretching his right hand to the man whilst approaching. The man's smirkish smile grew slightly wider across his face as Wade approached, giving the man a warmer and more welcoming demeanour. The man then held out his right hand as well, mirroring the gesture displayed by Wade, and also making him stop approaching suddenly with a sharp look on his face, making an expression that said, What the hell am I looking at? At first glance, Wade thought he was just wearing some kind of shiny glove. However, after just a few moments of true observation, did Wade realise, with no small amount of surprise, this was in fact his hand. A hand that could only be considered normal if you were a freaking Terminator. I won't bite you, Mr. Hawthorne said comically, snapping Wade out of his stupor. Uh, sorry, sir, he said, before completing the introductory gesture, shaking the man's unique hand. Mr. Hawthorne very gingerly shook Wade's hand as if he were trying not to hurt him. i never seen a prosthetic like that, sir, said Wade. It moves so fluently. I bet it must have cost a pretty penny, no doubt. Here, said the man, both changing the subject and revealing his left hand that had remained behind his back until now. His left hand was both normal and holding a key. This is for you, he said to Wade by handing it to him. This will give you access to the first floor of the house, including all of its amenities and supplies. And there is plenty of food, bathrooms, drinks, and pretty much anything you could possibly need. I even left the gun safe open, in case, oh, God forbid, you run into any trouble up here. It's not uncommon at all to see grizzlies and mountain lions this far out. On the way up the mountain, I actually saw the biggest buck I've literally ever seen in my life, said Wade excitedly. I mean, it was unnaturally big, and not afraid of my loud vehicle in the slightest, which is quite odd to say the least. Well, this statement made Mr. Hawthorne smile return again briefly before once again changing the subject. Now be gone for a few days, Wade. Everything you could possibly need will be on the first floor, and please help yourself to anything. I only have one condition, son, 
Yes, sir. Anything you want answered? Call me John. The man said, grinning at him. After a few more minutes of exchanging pleasantries, John clasped Wade on the shoulder with his left hand, which, although normal, still had an iron-like grip, and told him to make himself at home, not to work too hard. And laughing at this while walking over to his oversized Range Rover. Right before John grabbed the vehicle's door handle, he turned back to Wade with an entirely serious look upon his face and said, Feels like there's a storm coming, and a damn big one at that, son. You be careful and stay vigilant. Don't be shy about going inside. I think you might find some usefulness in there, if such an event was to arise. John said matter-of-factly, and almost hintingly. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I mean, John. Wade said, correcting himself. John took a step away from his vehicle's door, and looking directly into Wade's eyes, said, Some storms bring more than thunder and lightning, my boy. He then glanced down at his metallic hand, before turning and entering his Range Rover and departing. Wade simply smiled and waved, chalking an ominous comment up to a metaphor about how bad things can go wrong in a life and began its job. Now the first two days consisted of mostly moving supplies from his van to the roof and tearing out the first of the weathered shingles and plywood. Wade had bought an extra long extension cord for the nail gun and so he could keep the air compressor on the ground while working anywhere on the roof. For he wasn't about to even consider lugging that heavy piece of machinery up seven stories to the roof. But carrying the boards and shingles up was definitely the most time-consuming part of the two days. And now... With enough building supplies in place, he could get down to the real work. It was only an hour and a half that went by until we needed a break. We had been punching in the large three and a half inch farming nails with Biggin, and the Wade was making his right arm burn from overuse at this point. After setting the large nail gun down, he raised his right arm and pulled it behind his neck with his left hand, stretching out the sore and tense muscles of his neck and shoulder. <sighs> Sighing, he sat down on the side of the roof facing his van and the mansion's front entrance with the intention of enjoying his lunch break with a nice view. However, he quickly realized that his lunch was still in the van and so decided to finally take up John on his previous offer. Wayne thought he would eat his food on the mansion's first floor and check out the interior architecture. Sighing again at his own stupidity, he grabbed the ladder's edge and began to put his right foot on the first step to begin his descent down, before a loud crack sounded from the forest directly in front of the mansion, and a noise made him stop before his foot even touched the ladder, and was quickly followed by more sounds of the same nature. So distant in fact that whatever was making the noise had to be very large, thought Wade, and his shotgun, huh, I was in the van. Well, maybe I should stay up here until the noises go away, or come close enough to be identified, he thought. Well, whatever it was, it didn't seem to be in a hurry, for the cracks and crashes throughout the immediate woods before him moved methodically, and with seeming purpose. Could people possibly make that much noise whilst hiking through the woods, he thought. Well, maybe, if they were clear on a trail as they walked. This is private property. The whole damn mountain is, in fact, according to John. Uh, people get lost, Wade thought to himself. Maybe lost hikers or even a damn poach. But the thought was instantly cut off, as a pair of massive antlers appeared briefly in the tree line before the thick summer foliage covered them back up. Wade's breath caught with excitement, making him cough just a little before exclaiming, It's him! Wade reprimanded himself for yelling out loud and grabbed the phone from his back pocket. Well, I can't believe I'm getting another chance to, but his thoughts were cut off yet again when he, for the briefest moment, saw two more pairs of unnaturally large antlers quickly following the first. Three record-breaking bucks together at once? Well, this wasn't right, and with that realization, a floodgate of even more peculiar things opened up and burst a carefully constructed dam of reason within his mind. 
That's impossible. The antlers, they... It can't be. Not a position the antlers were in was not possible. Not right. Wade had walked the property a few times by now and had even hiked a bit around his first day at work. And had gotten a good blueprint of the property in his mind by now. That's why he was so very alarmed. For the first spot was easily 15 feet high, minimum. And they didn't move like deer, but shifted back and forth in the ways only bipedal creatures can do. What is this? As if to answer Wade's internal question, the first pair of antlers slowly emerged from the woods, along with what they were connected to. Wade had always heard people explain in movies and books how a cold chill would run up the person's spine, or how their nerves or insides would turn to ice, freezing them in place. Contradictory to everything he had heard, Wade felt hot, like every single nerve in his body was screaming at his brain, the way a child would scream in a tantrum until their faces go red and hot, trying to convey stormy emotions that they cannot understand, let alone explain. This was hot panic, thought Wade. And as the chorus of his nerves hit its panic crescendo, all the logic and reason left him. Like being abandoned by your oldest and most reliable friend and being left in the dark with the image of that face approaching. And the impossible implication of the name it ushered with it. Monster. Mid-crouching position in front of the ladder, and with his phone still in his right hand, the creature seemed to be scanning the immediate area, searching hard for something, apparently but it had yet to look up. The roof was so high, the monster would have to look extremely far up to see him, and if he laid flat, it probably wouldn't be able to view him at all. And with this thought, he broke out of the hold that the Inferno of Shock had placed him in, and proceeded to lay flat, in order to stomach crawl to the nearest pile of shingles he had carried up to the roof prior. Oh, thank God I stacked them all in one carelessly tall pile, thought Wade appreciatively. Now, in a cover position, he let all the questions that were trapped in his fear-locked mind out, and had to try and slow them down willingly before they made any kind of sense. What is this thing? How did they get here so quick when they were obviously so far away? Oh, no creature moves that fast, do they? thought Wade anxiously. Did I die on this roof and those were literal demons coming to usher me to hell, he thought. No, I have lived a good and decent life, hadn't I? Well, he started breathing in and out slowly, checking his pulse while doing so. No, I'm definitely alive. And if I'm going to stay that way, I need to access the full situation and come up with a plan. He thought, logically. And realizing his phone was still in his hand, he thought he should attempt to record evidence of this supernatural event, since he was fortunate enough to be stuck on a relatively safe vantage point. At least he kept telling himself he was safe, as not to send his already frayed nerves into a panic attack. And Wade cautiously stuck his head out from the bottom left corner of the shingle pile, which stood about four and a half feet high and about seven feet wide. Every ounce of panic returned with a vengeance upon seeing the face again. It still remained in the same position, cautiously scanning back and forth with the other pairs of antlers poised still behind him, like they were waiting for the all-clear signal from their leader. Wade couldn't begin to even comprehend what to do, and so he just stayed there on the roof sedge, in a half-standing, half-crouched position, to fully take in the creature's appearance from his shield of roof supplies. The amalgamation of bone and muscle was his first coherent thought of description. The unnaturally sharp and curved antlers led to a forehead of all skull, except for the massive veins and faint sinewy tendons that ran through the bone, making it look organic and alive. More like a living exoskeleton than mere bone. The side cheeks were mostly raw, exposed and overdeveloped jaw muscle, and with the same organic bone-like material piercing out in high, sharp ridges 
through the cheek muscle. The rest of the head was covered in obsidian black fur, and with ribs here and there, and where the muscle was so prominent, it appeared to tear through the creature's skin. And all of this led down to a slightly elongated jaw that was wide and ending more flatly, round than actually just pointed, seeming to have both canine and feline characteristics for its mandible structure. This blended together with an unknown yet undeniable human-like appearance that shared a similar marrow and muscle-type structure as its face. Now, its jaw was slightly agape as it sniffed and looked around the immediate area, revealing sharp teeth that were about three times longer than the smartphone in his hand, which he had forgot he was even holding till now. He swiftly hit the power button on the side of the phone twice to engage the quick camera feature, and having to use both hands to control the nerves making his hands shake, he held the phone up to his face, before his stomach dropped and heart began to pound. It was gone. He quickly lowered the phone to see how far or where they had gone, but to his complete surprise, they were all still there. The ghastly face, still scanning the area, with the other still in tow, about twenty feet behind. A confused, Wade pulled the camera back up to his face, just to be met with the same oddity. The same absence of what he knew to be there, and saw with his naked eye. Up, down. Up, down. There, gone. There, gone. He repeated this process like playing a demented and terrifying game of peekaboo with the creatures. His mind brought up paranormal television programs and creepy blurry internet pictures of cryptids and how it seemed impossible to get any good footage. Or maybe these creatures could easily be viewed by secondary means, like cameras, mirrors, etc. And how such a thing could even be possible. <sighs> Wade sighed. After this, the realm of what's real and possible had been greatly widened, for the world's natural and supernatural was slowly becoming one and the same to him. His thoughts were converted back to mindless panic when a hand with fingers over half the length of his leg, tipped with long and slightly curved black claws, made an all too familiar gesture as it raised its arm up and moved it sweepingly forward, just like a military captain would silently gesture to his men to advance ahead after making sure the coast was clear. Without a second of hesitation, the other two creatures followed their orders, and with their heads now clearing a thick vegetation and stopping parallel with the first, and now obviously larger creature, seemingly waiting for him to take the first move. And take the first move, he did. Abandoning the caution that it once held, the larger beast dropped to all fours and with a scream deep and roaring like a bear, with a loud, crazed, manic, human edge to it, the creature began rampaging around the entire property, with the other two following behind. At first, Wade thought after the extensive sniffing and scanning that they had picked up his scent and were coming directly for him, but right before they reached the front of the house, the back two creatures swiftly ran around opposite sides of the mansion, while the first creature and apparent leader Jack Wade's van. Ripping the back door off like a gardener pulling a particularly weak weed from the earth, using no real effort at all. After inspecting the van's contents, it stood still, but vigil, checking the area while the others finished their frenzied search and coming back empty-handed. And they, all three stood still in the open now, and we could see their full and unhidden form in all of its magnificent horror. They more or less all looked the same, except for the leader, who stood about six feet taller than the rest and with more muscle. The others also had dark brown fur, where the leader's was vanta black, void of darkness. Their torso looked extremely skinny compared to their bulky upper body, but still lean, like it was impossible for them to hold fat anywhere. In fact, their stomachs looked extremely malnourished and thin, which contrasted hard against their muscles. Their arms were so unnaturally long that their claws almost raked the ground as they walked on two legs. Their hands. Oh, God, their hands, thought Wade fearfully, 
They were so extremely large and out of symmetry, the rest of the body, that they could wrap around the entire torso of a bull moose, and with their ridiculous strength, probably crush it in half with one hard squeeze. That skin it was so tight in places on its shoulders, chest and back and arms, that the muscle ripped through the fur and flesh. The best way that he could simply describe it was if someone took a human, a demon and about a dozen forest creatures and combined them into one single abomination. All Wade could think now was how very easily those massive claws could scale the mansion and find him. And cowering behind a stack of shingles without a weapon or any hope, grabbed at his still holstered ice picks, thinking if they could be any match against all those wholly destructive and enormous claws. Not with that reach of theirs, he thought drearily. If only I had my gun, thought Wade. And then a small hopeful realization came into his mind. Biggin! He slowly crawled on his stomach again to reach the nail gun. After grabbing it, he cautiously moved so that the hose still connected to the air compressor would not move too much, alerting the monsters as to his existence. Well, Wade knew the safety guard was barely spot welded on and with the right amount of applied leverage, it would snap off, effectively making it a three and a half inch now shooting projectile weapon. Yes, he thought. This was a sound plan and would work out fine, as long as the pressure hose stayed attached to the... Oh no. He started to internally panic. No, 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 no. And since the arrival of his unnatural and unwanted guests, the air compressor had yet to turn on. And it, like clockwork, needed to recompress the air about every half hour, depending on how much use it was under. Well, the creatures appeared too intelligent not to figure out what was going on, if and when the compressor kicked on. And his thoughts were temporarily halted as one of the creatures opened its mouth wide and spoke. Not like a person, though. It merely opened its jaw, and without moving its mouth an inch, a voice crept out like an ominous gust of wind, sounding both smooth and gravelly, and not at all organic or alive. It was like the ghost of a voice. He must have known the... The beast was cut off by the loud compression of air given off by the machine's function engaging. All three creatures instantly looked at the machine and slightly advanced upon it. After their gazes followed the cord from the machine to the roof, the leader nodded at one of the others before he began to sink his claws into the mansion's walls and start scaling upwards. The monster didn't make it more than two seconds before the walls lit up with bright blue runes and a massive burst of blue energy violently propelled it off the wall, sending the beast soaring about 100 yards before it hit the ground, barely conscious and slightly on fire with blue flames. The flames went out quickly, however the creature took a bit longer to recover from the blast. And Wade he had no clue as to what could have saved him in such a manner, and looked around sporadically to see if God or angels had actually answered his prayers. If so, there was nothing here now, except for a blue glowing light issuing from the front of the house, and quickly fading as the seconds by. But a monster who had made a vicious scream of pain and rage when it mansion defended itself was now just breathing heavy and trying to gain his strength and composure back. It's protected, exclaimed the leader. How? remarked one of the other creatures. The Boundary Warden could not have done this so quickly unless he had help, said the leader curiously. Yes, spoke the now recovered creature as it rose once again on two legs like the others. And I've smelled ripe human flesh since we have arrived. Indeed, said the leader. Judging by the van and equipment, I'd say it's a normal human from the other side. And at this statement... The other two creatures bellowed out a yipping scream like manna that sounded similar to hyenas, but with a demonic and slightly static sounding undertone. 
Wade assumed this to be laughter, and instantly knew the utterly alien and unnerving noise would haunt his nightmares for years to come. Wrong place, wrong time indeed, little rabbit, mocked the leader as the maddening, heinous laughter increased to such a volume that Wade could feel the noise rumbling within his chest, like he was lying next to the subwoofer that was pulling noise straight from hell itself. Quickly, the leader went silent and snapped his head at once to one of the other creatures, and then to the treetops. Not in once, the creature swiftly started climbing the tree, and halfway up, Wade realized in panic what was happening. It was checking the roof. At that height, his shingle pile would be next to useless as cover. He thought while he desperately searched around for a miracle. There, Wade thought. Without the time to second-guess himself, he half-crouched and ran, and then crawled the last few feet to the large blue tarp covering his work from potential bad weather, and slid down under it, covering himself up with one quick and fluent movement. He even held his breath to keep the tarp from making even micro-movements, and stayed like that for what felt like minutes before he was forced to start breathing, and doing it slowly to still minimize any movement from within the tarp. After a few minutes, it felt like a few hours, he heard the creature hit the ground with a very soft thud. Had it simply jumped down? Thought Wade. But that tree was about 200 feet. Search the woods. You can't be far. Wade heard the leader order before he heard the sound of the beast run away on all fours into the night. Thank you, God, Wade said mentally, before beginning to breathe normal again. Darkness was starting to fall now, and Wade had to face the reality that he was spending the night on this roof, trapped above hell, in the middle of nowhere, and on the top of a mountain that wasn't even locatable by GPS. In fact, Mr. Hawthorne's assistant had physically driven him up here due to the fact that it also was not on any maps. Way dismissed this at first because it was such a remote location, but now he had to wonder if there was more to it. He turned off his phone to save the 81% battery he had remaining, and got as comfortable as he could under his tarp, clutching big and like a security blanket, and let his mind wander, silently thanking the heavens that it wasn't winter. And after seeing such impossibly traumatic and horrifying things, it was unthinkable to assume he was going to find any kind of sleep tonight, or at least that's what he genuinely thought. But after hours and hours of hard work, and then going into a state of near shock directly after, his body had tied itself physically and mentally. Combine that with the white noise of the air compressor sound enough periodically, Wade soon found himself being lulled into unconsciousness after about three and a half hours. In his mostly unconscious state, he began hearing a humming of machinery which he assumed to be the air compressor, until the slow build-up of the humming increased enough to snap him out of his slumber. He awoke alarmed and slightly confused, until all the scattered thoughts of the previous night came coherently together. At the same moment that his recollections became clear, so did the mechanic humming sound that had awoke him. He identified the sound at the exact same time he heard lumbering footfalls enter the forest. He shimmied back over to his trusty shingle pile and now witnessed the creatures retreating from the sound. And from a vehicle, Wade now knew from his work schedule, and small talk with John to be the electrician. And for a split second, Wade thought he was saved, that they were running away and giving up, that the real world was coming to chase off the nightmare fantasy one, and all would go back to normal, and he would escape this damn mountain and return to the safe real world. No, 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 Wade said under his breath, they are not retreating. As the monster stopped about thirty feet within the forest and crouched beside some trees, kneeling away, a sprinter would position themselves before a race. No, no, 
They were ambushing him. Wade felt utterly helpless as the large work van, similar to his own, pulled into the driveway. He could see two men were inside the van, an overweight bald and white man and a youthful young Hispanic man with good looks and a lean build. When the van had a metal wall separating the front seats from the equipment in the back, much like Wade's van, except the wall was solid, instead of being a see-through mesh grate like his own, and it apparently had a door that could be accessed from the front directly, whereas Wade had to exit his van and go through the back doors. Wade saw the young Latin man enter the metal door and disappear into the back, shutting the door behind him as the bald man expected paperwork up front. The creatures moved so quickly they were an effective blur, moving from being crouched in the woods to standing in front of the van, before the noises of them violently exiting the woods even reached Wade's ears. They just moved faster than sound could travel, without even issuing a sonic boom, thought Wade hysterically. How, though? Wade had seen them sprint around the property when this nightmare first began, and yes, they were unnaturally fast and frighteningly quick, but this was a whole other level of supernatural. If Wade did not hear the trees ripping and physically see them fall succeeding the creature's advance, he might have assumed they just teleported from the woods to the van. And before a comprehensible thought could pass through Wade's mind, the van's front windshield was shattered, along with the bald man's head. And with one oversized hand, the leader reached into the van's cab and threw what was left of the man's body to the other beasts. Without pause, it devoured the man's body in just a few wet squelchy and crunchy bites, yipping in its hyena-like fashion as the leader inspected the other vehicle. Apparently satisfied, the leader walked over to the other creature who had just finished off all the remaining bits of the man. He should have returned hours ago, said the leader, with his tone now slightly less intense as the night before. Should I go search? No, shouted the leader, silencing the other's query. We are stronger together, and Master Elrock will arrive this nightfall. And when that happens, no amount of protection, rather magic or muscle, will stand in our way. Their ghastly voices slowly faded as they began walking the woodline surrounding the property, which was basically the entire mountain top. In another few minutes, they would be at the farthest corner of the property, and Wade reached into his right pocket and brought out the keys that John had left him three days prior and stared at them intently. This was going to be the best shot of making a move I'm going to get, thought Wade. As he called over to the big one, and surveyed the situation from a closer vantage point, Wade caught movement out the corner of his right eye. The other electrician, Wade mentally exclaimed. And due to the intense horror of everything that just unfolded, he completely forgot about the other man. Apparently, going to fetch supplies from the back had saved his life. Fortunately, the man was smart enough to stay hidden and quiet in the back until the opportunity arose. This opportunity. Wade saw the upper half of the man's body peeking through the metal door that separated the cap from the back. The cap was completely covered in gore, and Wade could see the shock on the young man's face as he cautiously waved his arms back and forth to get Wade's attention. And Wade acknowledged him with a thumbs up and quickly started trying to sign his plan to the man as best he could. Wade used his hand to make a fist next to his phone and then pulled his fist away while opening his palm, trying to convey and emulate an explosion of noise. Wade then made a gesture that looked as if he was going to throw his phone, like a frisbee, towards the direction of the creatures. He then pulled the keys out and pointed down to the front door of the house, letting the man know he had direct access to the mansion. Now Wade had repeated this signing process several times until the man gave him two enthusiastic thumbs up 
to convey that he now understood the plan. Wade had up five fingers and then pointed to his wrist to simulate a watch and then counted his fingers out from one to five and then pointed to him. The young man and then the front door again trying to make him understand that they both make a move on the count of five. But he'd only had to sign this gesture twice this time in order for the young man to comprehend. And after both parties were fully aware of the shared plan, Wade stilled himself, and with one deep breath in and out, he began the countdown. One. Wade kept a steady eye on the creatures to make sure they were still far enough away. Two. He firmly grasped Biggin in his right hand, putting his finger over the trigger, but not on it, the way he had seen soldiers do in movies so he didn't accidentally commit for any fire or self-harm. Three. He made sure the hose connected from the air compressor to the nail gun was freed of any tangles before putting his right foot on the ladder. Four. Wade looked down at the young man and nodded as he reciprocated the gestures of Wade in mutual understanding of what was about to happen and its possible consequences. Five. Throwing caution and coherent thought behind, Wade raced down the ladder. Thanks to nailing the ladder down, he was able to descend it much easier than normal, skipping steps and abandoning them altogether. About ten feet from the ground, he jumped. After he descended to the ground, his nail gun hitting the earth directly after his feet, he quickly held it with both hands and turned left to inspect the beast's location. They seemed to be in the process of turning around the same time Wade did, forcing him to make direct eye contact for the first time. For an uninterrupted few seconds, Wade and Alida just stared into each other's eyes from a great distance. Well, Wade stared into something, for there appeared to be no eyes, just large, vacant holes of Vanta Black, so ominous and deep. That for a moment, he thought he was staring into the pits of hell. In the monster's all-consuming gaze, Wade was overcome with an unparalleled dread that if he was eaten by this abomination, that his very soul would become so corrupted in the demon's gut that he would never see heaven or any afterlife that was completely damned. And before Wade could drown in this overwhelming hopelessness, a hand grabbed his right shoulder. C come on, man! Get the key, come on! Wade snapped out of whatever trance he was in, like someone dumped a bucket of ice water over his head. Here, Wade thrust the keys into the young man's hand. I'll cover you. Open her up. Wade held up Biggin and started inching back toe to heel, again mimicking soldiers he'd watched on television. The monstrous leader let out another loud manic roar which rattled Wade's very organs and almost blurred his vision. It was like the creature who was screaming inside of his very body and soul. He thought about how quick the monsters had ambushed the electrician and wondered if this was all futile. The leader took off and was heading at them about 60 miles per hour. An incredible speed, but not at all impossibly fast. And while the leader roared in hateful rage, the other creatures yipped maniacally in excitement, savoring the chase to come. Wade had bats up all the way to the door, where the young man was still fumbling with the key. Hurry, boy! yelled Wade while firing a barrage of three and a half inch steel framing nails, which slowed the creature down to about 35 miles an hour. But it wasn't enough. They were mere seconds away. With a clawed hand bigger than Wade's entire upper body raised for the kill, the creature closed the distance at the same time that a strong pair of hands put Wade inside the threshold, missing his flesh and destroying the nail gun instead of his head. The young man went to slam the front door shut, but was hindered as the tips of the four fingers stuck through, blocking the locking mechanism and doorknob. And with no time to spare or hesitation to have, Wade unsheathed his right ice pick, and with two mighty swings, three of the fingers fell to the floor as the remaining digit retreated back. Before anyone could even breathe, 
The young man shut the door and locked it. Upon the door's closing, about three dozen runes lit up around the door with a blue glow. Simultaneously, the same blue glow lit up outside, followed by the familiar shrieks of agony from the monster. Protected indeed, Wake thought to himself, recalling the leader's prior statement about the mansion. Wade now understood what happened when the monster tried scaling the walls of the house the previous day. Both men lay on the floor panting before the young man spoke. What the fuck? What the fuck, man? What are those things? What are those lights? What the hell is happening? What? The young man's breaths were becoming increasingly rapid. Why? His breathing started transitioning into panic as he breathed faster and more frantic. Why, slow down, said Wade calmly. You're in shock, and if you don't try and calm down, then you're going to go into... But it was too late. The young man who Wade could see was named Daniel from his name tag, who started to hyperventilate into a panic attack. And Wade slowly helped him to his feet, where he half carried, half walked into the couch, where he insisted Daniel lay on his side with his hands pressed between his knees, and just focus on taking slow, deep breaths. He left Daniel to his breathing exercise and began to pilfer around the house looking for a satellite phone or anything that could be of use to them. And Wade remembered Mr. Hawthorne telling him about leaving a gun safe opened and began searching around with more enthusiasm. The mansion's first floor was one giant wide open space, like a loft but much larger and extremely high class. It was adorned with expensive statues and art, most of which depicted angels fighting demons, and with the latter being defeated in very elaborate and dramatic ways. The room's centerpiece looked like it would be more in place in a Roman cathedral than some random mansion on top of a mountain. It showed four angels, much larger than any of the rest in the mansion, and with the earth in the middle, like a detailed statue of a globe. Now, each angel stood on a specific axis of a compass, like north, south, east and west. Next to each directional point was a name, and they read Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel. Wade recognized Michael and Gabriel as archangels from the Bible, but had never heard the latter two names. They must be archangels as well, he thought. Upon closer inspection, he also noticed an element under each name as well. Air, fire, water, and earth. And this brought way to an epiphany. Well, no wonder Michael had a flaming sword, and sure enough, under the name Michael was the element fire. There were only six rooms in the open first floor. A bedroom, where Wade found a 9mm Beretta and a few clips. A locked door, three bathrooms, and a door Wade had yet to check. Now, besides a little coffin... Daniel had not yet made a sound, and so Wade decided to check on him. He was sitting up now, seemingly more relaxed and holding something in his right hand. Before he reached Daniel, he saw him put whatever it was in his hand to his mouth as a green light lit up, followed by the sounds of deep inhalation. Well, that explains the coffin, said Wade, smiling. You feeling any better? he asked. Exhaling, Daniel tried to hand him Wade the vape. Pure indica, he said, noticeably calmer. Uh, maybe later, Wade answered truthfully. How are you not freaking out right now? asked Daniel. Huh, I had a few panic attacks on the roof already, said Wade. Wait, Daniel stated. How long have you been up there? Almost 24 hours, replied Wade. Damn responded Daniel, in a shocked yet sympathetic tone. Oh, there's supposed to be a gun safe the owner left open. Is that where you got that? said Daniel, pointing at the 9mm tucked onto Wade's belt. Uh, no, replied Wade. Found this in the bedroom. No shit, exclaimed Daniel excitedly. Well, I'm going to go check it out. Uh, I think this was about it, but... 
Knock yourself out. That's the room on the back right. As Daniel made his way to search the bedroom more thoroughly, Wade ventured to the last room on the first floor, hoping that it would not be locked, and for the first lock room was a steel locking mechanism. Hoping that it would not be locked, for the first lock room was a steel locking mechanism on a steel frame. Or more simply put, it was kick-proof and adorned with high-tech security locks. As Wade made his way to the last door, he began noticing a familiar sight next to the right side of the door. A safe. He picked up his pace as he closed in on the safe, noticing a small gap where the door had indeed been left open by John. Well, the safe was about seven feet tall, giving Wade hope that this indeed was the gun safe due to its size. Yes! hissed Wade in confident excitement, for after opening a safe door, the rest of the way, his eyes lay upon a beautiful sight. There were nine in total, two rifles, two shotguns, and three assault rifles, another nine millimeter Barretta, and one particularly intriguing Magnum, a forty-four Colt Python with shiny metal silver plating and a black ergonomic grip. Along with the weapons was about two or three dozen boxes of various ammunition. Wade pulled a Barretta from his waist and replaced it with a Colt Python. Now before he yelled for Daniel to come and join him in arming themselves, he thought it wise to inspect the remaining door beforehand. And as he reached for the door handle, something happened that startled him and made him retreat a few steps back. Wade removed the magnum and readied it, pointing it at the door while silently praising himself for already loading it. But when he previously reached for the door handle, it opened itself. Standing back and peering into the small gap left when a door opened, he stood, gun raised and waited for anything. For in this new and frightening world that previously only existed in his worst nightmares, anything was now possible. However, what came out of the door was not at all what Wade expected. In fact, it wasn't even a physical being at all. Wade, Wade, can you hear me? Said a voice that crept its way through the gap in the door. A voice he faintly recognized. John? Wade finally stammered out. Yes, my boy, yes, come in, both of you. Please, come inside, for there is much we have to discuss. Wade inched his way into the room, gun raised. He only made it about two steps in, the brightly lit room, before lowering his gun, and his jaw along with it. Oh my god, said Wade, in complete awe and surprise. That's right, my boy. If we are to survive this night, then God is, as always, a greatest ally. Said John's face, which was being displayed through what looked like a 200-inch flat screen on the far wall, up high and directly in front of him, about 100 feet away. The room was unnaturally bright and white, much like super high-tech lamps you see in science fiction movies. It spread out 100 feet long and about 70 feet wide, with a long, rectangular, mostly transparent table to span the length of the room. The left side of the room's walls were composed of monitors, computers, and one long desk built into the wall below it all, seemingly being some sort of security monitoring station. All Wade's attention was pulled towards the right wall, though. That was nothing short of an armory. He glimpsed at every gun imaginable, from AK-47s to freaking rocket launchers, and that was just the recognisable weapons. About 40% of the arsenal's contents were made up of items and weapons Wade had never ever seen before in his life. I never knew to even be real at all. They were guns that looked purely of alien design. Staffs with glowing orbs adorned on top of them. Swords, spears and axes with glowing runes engraved in them that bore a similarity to the protection runes he saw upon the door being shut and activating the mansion's defences. Wade even saw spherical glass-like containers that were filled with water and wrapped in silver bands covered in elaborate crucifixes, which he assumed to be holy water. And John watched Wade 
patiently from the monitor, smiling his smirkish smile as Wade took it all in. You found it! A voice loudly exclaimed from outside the door, as he heard Daniel sorting through the various guns within a normal gun safe, just around the corner from the open door. I don't know what you're doing in there, Daniel said as Wade heard his voice moving closer to him. But what right now could possibly be more important than Gert? Daniel's voice paused abruptly upon entering the room. Hans, and slowly finishing his initial statement a few seconds later, while taking in the impossible sight. Wade, Daniel. John's voice sounded through the speakers that circled the entirety of the room's other walls. Now that you're both here, we have much to discuss, my friends. How do you know my name? asked Daniel. Your name tag, son, replied John at the same time Wade pointed to the identification badge on the upper right portion of the young man's company shut. Oh, right, replied Daniel nervously. All will be explained. Well, as much as you need to know, at least. John said, correcting himself. You boys grab a seat and get comfortable. This won't be a short story and we only have until nightfall to prepare for the storm of hell that blows this way. Uh, something tells me that when you say hell, you're not talking about frozen balls of ice, said Wade, as he sensed the change in John's demeanor. Noticeable, even through the screen his face was projected on. The kind of change that comes over a person when they are about to be 100% serious with you, and cast all bullshit aside. Have a seat, and let's get started, said John, as more of an order this time than a request, and the two men took their seats and waited patiently for John to begin. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an absolute treat that was. Exhilarating and full of so many layers and directions. I wonder where it's going to take us next. Of course, an incredible huge thank you to the wonderful author, and Mr. David Morning Wade. Really drew me in from the first paragraph, David. Absolutely fantastic writing. And of course, I hope you enjoyed my rendition and look forward to uploading the next parts. Well, guys and girls, as ever, a brand new author, we just seem to be adding more and more, and it suddenly makes me very proud. But of course you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you think you can write something that's just as epic, just as thrilling and exhilarating as that, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. We'll try and get the next few chapters of this one up ASAP, guys. It's about 78 pages long, so I'm afraid I run out of time and my throat is raw. But as ever, don't forget to smash the like button, and if you haven't subscribed to the channel, why not throat punch the subscribe button and tickle the notification bell to stay up to date with all DMT content. As ever, much love and respect guys, I hope you're all well and happy and taking a fight back to life. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.